Welcome back, America. To Hewitt, joined by United States Senator Tom Cotton of the state of Arkansas. Good morning, Senator Cotton. Good morning, Hugh. It's good to be back on with you. Now, I must tell you, Senator, the University of Arkansas has uh, crossed a red line. I, this, is, this show has long been a bastion of anti-rexophobia. And here I find a study by the University of Arkansas paleontologist group of researchers out at the uh, Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument suggesting that T-Rexes traveled in packs. I think this is simply more systemic rexophobia, and I'm shocked to find it at the University of Arkansas. <laughs> I was wondering why I got the Jurassic Park bump music cue, uh, but it uh, was an interesting story. I just saw the headline this morning as I was heading out. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I look forward to it. Well, there's also a 2014 uh, a Bureau of Land Management paleontologist named Alan Titus who named this site the Rainbows and Unicorns Quarry. I think that's a federal issue deserving of some oversight as well. <laughs> I, I think I'll let my friends out in the Rocky Mountain states uh, handle that fight. Well, this rexophobia is systemic, and, and your university is contributing to it. All right, I got some other stories for you. Number one, Russia moves troops near Ukraine. According to ABC News, between 68,000 and 100,000 Russian troops have now moved to the border of Ukraine. What is going on there? What is the message that President Biden and Secretary Blinken ought to be delivering to President Putin? Well, unfortunately, Hugh, Joe Biden has already sent a message of weakness to Vladimir Putin from day one. Uh, his policy has been, in effect, speak loudly and carry a twig. Um, I know Joe Biden likes to beat his chest about being tough on Russia, but just look at what's happened to Russia policy since January 20th, Hugh. First off, we gave Vladimir Putin his number one foreign policy priority, which is a clean extension of the New START nuclear arms control treaty, a treaty that is badly one-sided against the United States. Now we're giving him his new number one priority, which was his number two priority, which is completion of the gas pipeline uh, that runs underwater into Germany, which will hook Western Europe even more deeply onto Russian gas, meaning that they won't be willing to stand up to Vladimir Putin and Russia on their eastern flank. And then just look at some of the other things we've done to you. Um, you know, uh, Joe Biden acknowledged last week that the sanctions he imposed were half measures, that he could have done more, but he didn't want to. And at the same time, he invited Vladimir Putin to join him at some rinsy European capital this summer for a summit. And just last week, we also canceled the deployment of a couple of our ships into the Black Sea at the very same time that Vladimir Putin is building up his army and his naval presence uh, on the North Black Sea coast of Ukraine and uh, on the eastern border of Ukraine. Buildups that never happened uh, during the Trump era. So Vladimir Putin, I think, sent his weakness, and I hope that Joe Biden will uh, signal him that uh, we won't tolerate any kind of incursion uh, into Ukraine uh, on the Crimea further or on the uh, Black Sea coast of Ukraine. Now, what is the appropriate response should aggression against Ukraine occur, Senator Cotton? They are not members of NATO, so there is no mutual defense agreement in place as would occur with Poland or Romania. But what about if they come in with these 100,000 troops are not there for exercise? Um, well, Hugh, we don't know, know exactly why they are there, um, but I'll just say that uh, I always take something of a jaundiced eye of the assurances of the so-called experts that um, a dictator like Vladimir Putin is not intending aggression. You know, there's, there's a long history uh, of bad predictions of dictators building up military forces and then just conducting exercises. So whatever Vladimir Putin's intentions are, we know that he now has the forces built up in uh, the eastern border of Ukraine that he could strike further into the Donbass. Or perhaps he could do what many people suspected he might do in 2015, which is uh, invade into the uh, Black Sea Coast city of Mariupol to try to establish a land bridge uh, in the Sea of Azov, which is an important shipping plane for the Ukraine. One, part, one thing that we could simply do is to end the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Congress passed bipartisan sanctions last year uh, that would enable the administration to do so. Those sanctions are sitting on the shelf right now, Hugh. Uh, there's no reason that Joe Biden can't impose those or threaten to impose them if there is that kind of incursion into Ukraine. Yet, for some reason, he refuses to do so. I suspect it's because uh, he wants to curry favor uh, with uh, his friends in Germany and the rest of Western Europe. He doesn't want to be viewed as too tough or aggressive on our allies uh, the way his predecessor was. But sometimes you got to be tough to stand up to people like Vladimir Putin. 
Uh, without revealing anything that's classified, uh, does the United States also have knowledge of where his billions are parked and where his buddies' billions are parked? And can that money not be disintermediated if they invade Ukraine again? We have the ability, Hugh, to identify some of the ill gotten gains of Vladimir Putin and all of his crony oligarchs. Um, but I, I think probably not the full extent of it. I mean, they've been um, stealing the wealth of the Russian people for 20 years and hiding it for 20 years. Some of it's probably burrowed away in some pretty dark corners around the globe. But yes, we and our allies in Western Europe do have the ability to reach out and touch lots and lots of people who are uh, closely tied to Vladimir Putin and impose real pain on them. I mean, you look, I mean, there's some simple things you could do, Hugh. Imagine if they stood together and just revoked the visas, not only for a lot of these uh, Russian oligarchs, but for their family members as well. Almost every one of them have kids in fancy Western schools. Um, their wives have apartments in Paris and London. Their mistresses go shopping uh, in Rome and have yachts on the Mediterranean. Imagine stopping all of that. I bet those well, oligarchs would get an earful, yeah. wouldn't they? The Achilles heel of oligarchies is there aren't a lot of them. It's pretty easy to find out who you have to sanction, and hopefully that's on the table. I have a quote to read to you. Uh, General Secretary Xi gave a... Uh, speech yesterday at an economic forum in China, wherein he said, quote, no matter how far it develops, China will never seek hegemony, expand, seek spheres of influence, or engage in an arms race. What do you think, Senator Cotton? <laughs> well, I, I saw that they said that at some kind of international forum, at, because at first I thought he was doing it as a stand-up comedy routine. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, you don't have to take... Uh, Xi Jinping's words at face value at that forum. All you have to do is look at how China has deployed its natural, natural resources over the last 20 years, and especially over the last 10 years under Xi, and also what he says in front of his Politburo cronies. Uh, of course, what they expect to do is establish hegemony. Um, Xi, like many Chinese leaders going back centuries, views China as the so-called middle kingdom, uh, the ruler of all things uh, under the sun, and that the countries, especially on his periphery, but in the end, all around the world should be nothing but vassal states um, to China. And that's exactly what they've tried to do through their um, economic aggression against American workers and um, our uh, businesses for decades. It's exactly what they're trying to do to countries on their periphery, like Taiwan, um, and it's what they do to their own people. Um, so, no, I do not think that you could take Xi Jinping's words at face value yesterday to you. Now, they withdrew the Blue Bottom fleet from the Whitson Reef uh, as the Teddy Roosevelt Carrier Task Force grew close. What does that tell you, and, and what should we do in response to that learned experience? Yeah, so, Hugh, that, uh, the Blue Water um, fleet, that, or the Blue Fleet that China has is a kind of quasi-naval, quasi-Coast Guard force they use to harass the smaller countries on their periphery, especially in the South China Sea, um, to establish, you know, creeping control over all of those uh, islands, whether they're natural or artificial. Um, you shouldn't be surprised, though, that if a U.S. aircraft carrier comes through, that all those boats scatter. Um, it's kind of, um, you know, like little pests being driven away uh, by a giant predator. Um, but it's going to take that kind of resolve and um, presence in the South China Sea to ensure that China doesn't establish control over that entire vital waterway. Well, that brings up the defense budget that uh, a friend in the White House said, look, we increased defense spending. It did not keep pace with inflation. Will your committee and will appropriations be plussing it up? Well, I certainly hope that we will increase uh, Joe Biden's appallingly small defense budget. As you say, Hugh, um, it doesn't even keep pace with the inflation that Joe Biden's policies are uh, helping accelerate. Um, but even if it did, even if it just matched inflation, Hugh, the defense budget is the one part of our federal government where you can't have a strategy based on your budget. You have to have a budget based on your strategy. And given the growing threats we face from China in particular, but also a newly confident Iran um, and uh, continued aggression from Russia, we need to continue to increase our defense budget. And that's everything from our nuclear forces, as we're about to have testimony from the commander of Strategic Command in a couple of hours today in the Senate, um, as well as all of the cutting-edge aircraft and ships and the next generation of fighting vehicles and long-range cannons that our Army needs as well. Last question for you, Senator Cotton. This is from The Washington Post. Maria Sacchetti this morning, quote, the Biden administration has ordered U.S. immigration enforcement agencies to stop using terms such as 
alien, illegal alien, and assimilation when referring to immigrants in the United States, a rebuke of terms widely used under the Trump administration. I might add, those, uh, having covered Los Angeles for 10 years on PBS, it's a term widely used within PBS and basically widely used everywhere. And it was long before Donald Trump entered politics. What do you think of this? Well, it, sir, uh, Hugh, it's a t term that's widely used throughout the United States code books. You cannot write about immigration law without using the term alien because that is exactly what non-Americans are described as in the federal laws. And in fact, you, you know, um, our old friend Dick Durbin has been sponsoring something called the DREAM Act uh, for a couple decades now. Guess what the A in DREAM Act stands for? Yes, it's a terrible embarrassment uh, to our friends on the left. A in DREAM Act stands for alien. And if an alien is not here legally, what does that make them? An illegal alien. So Joe Biden can create all the speech police and write the speech codes that he wants, but in the end, we call a spade a spade. And an illegal alien is an illegal alien. Well, Senator Durbin, the Mr. Magoo of the Senate, is not exactly going to be uh, redrawing the DREAM Act. Now, I, I am just so curious, though. Assimilation is the one that really has my eyebrows up, Senator. Assimilation has been a long-honored tradition that every ethnic group in the United States, it doesn't mean giving up your cultural distinctiveness. It doesn't mean abandoning your love of, of in my case, things Irish and Scots. It means just becoming part of America. To assimilate is not to be dissolved in a big vat of acid. What in the world is that all about? Yeah, I mean, assimilation has been the longstanding goal um, of not only our immigration policy, but of new immigrants. Immigrants who fled lands have also oftentimes uh, where they had no political freedom, no civil rights, uh, and they wanted to come here and they wanted to assimilate into America, in particular into our political traditions. As you say, that doesn't mean abandoning your heritage. You know, we've had large-scale uh, Irish immigration going back to the 1840s, and we still have ce celebrations on St. Patrick's Day. You know, we have Columbus Day celebrating the heritage and contributions of Italian Americans. But, of course, those previous generations of immigrants have assimilated into American society, especially our political traditions, um, and that should be the goal for all new immigrants as well. Senator Cotton, good to talk to you, but I hope you get a, get a call in the University of Arkansas. This, this war against the T-Rexes has just got to stop, and I, it's systemic at your university. And the rainbows and unicorns, uh, that's another three strikes and you're out over at the Bureau of Land Management. Senator, thank you.